Welcome to Sex is Medicine, your number one resource for holistic sex education. I'm Davy Ward Erickson, and I invite you to join me every week for another enriching and powerful conversation about the intersection of sexuality, spirituality, pleasure, and personal growth. Each episode of Sex is Medicine is dedicated to awakening your heart and mind to the true purpose and power of human sexuality. Please join me on this journey of self-discovery as we explore the art of using pleasure as medicine to awaken, heal, and empower every area of your life. Sex is Medicine broadcasts every Thursday at 7 p.m. Pacific on Contact Talk Radio Network. You can listen to the replay and subscribe to Sex is Medicine on Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, iTunes, iHeartRadio, and YouTube. And now get ready for another episode of Sex is Medicine. Hey, hey, welcome to Sex is Medicine. I am your host, Davey Ward Erickson. Absolutely delighted to be here with you once again. I'm loving this every Thursday at 7 p.m. Showing up for you, breaking it down. We have a wonderful show in store for you with an associate of mine from Vancouver who's into erotic art and is going to help educate us about the toxic legacy of pornography, amongst other things. You can tune into Sex is Medicine, as I said, every Thursday evening at 7 p.m. on Contact Talk Radio Network. And of course, you can catch the replay on Spotify, iTunes, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, all your major podcasting networks. And don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube and all of these other networks as well, because you get the audio version of David Doodlebug and the video version, and both are wonderful up in your ears and eyes. Uh, so my guest this afternoon, this evening, is Ricardo Scipio. And Ricardo and I have been playing tag for a few years to connect about his amazing artwork uh, that he's doing and and uh, infiltrating into the realm of, of erotic photography and erotic art. Um, and I know you from Vancouver Connections, some, some we have mutual friends, mutual connections near and dear. Um, and please tell us a little bit about yourself. Where do you come from and, and, and why erotic art? I'll try, although you're a very hard act to follow, but I'll, <laughs> I'll try my best. I'm your friendly neighborhood sex photographer. Woo! I, hey, this is like Mr. Rogers. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Exactly. I'm, and I'm wearing a Mr. Rogers type, uh, you know, sweater. So, uh, yeah, um, like most people. Uh, like anyone, um, no one's born a sex photographer. So I was, I assure you, I was a normal person before I transformed into this thing that I am now. Um, I was just a skinny, like little kid from Trinidad. I was born in Trinidad, came to Canada as a little kid, um, had the normal, you know, black immigrant Canadian experience. No, okay, so I'm going to pause you there because we don't know what a normal black immigrant Canadian experience is. I'm from the States and, and living in Canada is like, I know it's not perfect, but I'm like, this is like the Holy Land. So, so information about you, uh, the, the normal black Canadian immigrant experience, what is that like? Um, for me, um, it was, uh, it was uh, traumatic. Yeah. I, I came from a country that's 48% black and 40% Indian from India. I came from a country where, you know, the president was black and school teachers are black, the bank manager's black or, you know, or Indian <laughs> or a mix, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And you come to a country where no one's black. Uh, the prime minister has certainly never been black. Never, ne never had a drop of non-white, non-rich, not non-male, you know, blood in their body. Um, the bank manager, you know, no one, you know, no one in any kind of authority figure um, was black. And yeah, all of a sudden you're a minority, and um, and you know, being a skinny little kid with you know a funny accent and an, and an Italian name, you 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 get a lot of unwanted attention. So definitely bullied, beaten, you know, despised, all that kind of, all that kind of thing. Yeah, and I would uh, say not just a minority, but a vilified minority. So it's not just like minorities. It, you know, that's that's a that's a nice way of sanitizing racism. 
Sure. It's, 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 not, it's, not, it's not like I was Latvian. You know, Latvians are a minority. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you were <It's> Polish. Not, <laughs> yeah, I wasn't Danish or German. Uh, yes, I was, uh, I was, you know, a black man from, you know, a, a little Caribbean country. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was a it was a funny childhood because Canada is the land of opportunity. So definitely, you get you know a nice standard of living. Even though we were quite poor, being poor in Canada is not so bad. I'd rather be poor in Canada than pretty much anywhere else in the world. Amen. Uh, you get a good education if you want it. You get good health care. You get all that kind of stuff. Clean streets, relatively you know crime free. At least it was that in those days. But you also get the, you know, sort of phoniness of Canada. Canada has always pretended that it was less racist than America, um, pretended there wasn't slavery in Canada. In fact, a lot of white Canadians that I talk to even now don't even know, like, how widespread slavery was in Canada and how Canada was integrated into that, that whole business. So, um, yeah, you get... Um, polite Canadians that uh, on the surface will smile and say hello and be friendly, but beneath the surface, um, you know, are, are probably more racist than Americans. I've actually had, I, and I've spent a fair amount of time in the States and I've actually had more racism in Canada than I have in the States. And I've actually, you know, we talked about this um, in our private conversations I've, I, you know, I've enjoyed being part of a black community in America. I've, I've enjoyed going to places like Atlanta, that's 70 percent black mm -hmm. and New Orleans that used to be 70 percent black before the hurricane. It's a bit different now, but those were amazing, you know, cities where, you know, it felt really good to be black. Mm -hmm. um, there's no such reality in Canada. There's, you know, there's nowhere in Canada that's a black city. <laughs> <laughs> a black mecca and um there isn't quite the sort of black culture i mean if you think about things like music uh what kinds of music have black canadians invented none <laughs> well you know what kind of drake i guess he didn't invent it but drake now drake he didn't invent it but drake is the man you can't go dissing drake <laughs> hey did i diss drake and don't forget the weekend are you trying to just the weekend? Are you trying to just the weekend? <laughs> no, but you know, I was saying invented. I mean, invented, when you go yeah. to the, when you go to the states, you get jazz, yeah. You get hip hop, you get all you know, even all these regional types of music and dance and culture, because um, the hip hop down south is very different than the hip hop on the west coast, which is different than the hip hop in New York. So. There's talk about whole, diversity talk about diver, diversity and same thing same thing with the blues i mean chicago yeah. blues isn't the same as the mississippi delta blues ah, um, it, you know and you know so yeah there is you know you so in canada there, there have been remarkable black canadians i mean in jazz you have someone like an oscar peterson um but he's oscar peterson you don't have uh, a legacy you know where you have everyone from miles davis to john coltrane to the Thelonious Monk, whatever. So it's a, you know, it's a different, you know, it's a different thing. Climate. It's, a, it's different a different climate. climate. It's a different climate. It's a different culture. And really, um, up until 1962, it wasn't entirely legal for Black people to immigrate to Canada. And that's another sort of little known fact about Canada. <laughs> so, um, so the racism is here. And, and what I find is that it's, it's, it's covert, Meaning, meaning, which is the most insidious type, where it's it's literally just just a a uh, anchoring of uh, in, in the mindset of white superiority without it ever having to be challenged by the proximity of lots of black people. So it's just an un unrecognized, unacknowledged, un unperceived orientation that that white is right and and that exists in the states too but what i find in canada is that it that it is so deeply ingrained in the psyche and again it hasn't had the challenge like at least in the united states when you have all you know all of the the tension of racism and all of that there's there's you have to look at it 
you know, you, 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 you have to, you have to at least acknowledge that, that there's, that there is racism and that there's different layers and different, different aspects of it. And that conversation is rising more to the surface now. But what I find in Canada is that again, it's, it's never been questioned. The white supremacy and white superiority of the white Canadian mindset, it's never, it's never been challenged. And so therefore it's just, it's, it's just, it's so completely normal that when it's actually pointed out, it's shocking. Sure. And also, um, there's not an acknowledgement of what racism actually is, because the sort of white liberal sort of idea of Canada is, as long as we don't personally hate you, or personally yes. um, want to harm you, then you don't have anything to complain about. Well, what they don't understand is, to me, racism isn't about who doesn't like me, I couldn't care less if some racist doesn't like me. What I care about is, you know, is there a level playing field for jobs? Is yes. there a level playing field for housing? Is there a level playing field for political power? Is there a level playing field in art? <laughs> I mean, let's just take the, the art world. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I was want to circle into that. So, so specifically, you being an erotic artist as a Black man in Canada... What are some of the special and unique challenges that you've noticed that you have to, because you've had that contrast as we spoke in our personal, in our personal conversations, you had the contrast of presenting art in, in majority black areas like Atlanta and New Orleans versus the contrast of doing it in white neoliberal Canada and having to deal with that, again, that covert racism. What are some of the things that you saw? Oh, I started even when I was in art school. I went to the best art school in Canada, the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. And when I was there, um, there was only two non-white students <laughs> out, of, out of 500. I mean, you do the math, um, that's pretty low. <laughs> wow. Wow. Two non-white students. See, that's the way I grew up, too. I agree. <laughs> that's where I grew up in Michigan. It was like <laughs> me and one other dude. That was it. <laughs> Yeah, it was me and, and one woman, um, and that was it. Um, all of our professors were white. We didn't. There wasn't one single non-white professor. Um, when we studied art history, there was no attention spent to African art. Um, there was no mention even of African-American art and the contributions of African-American artists. Um, so basically, you're treated like you're irre irrelevant. Yeah. Um, and you really have no input in, in what's going on. And then when you get out of art school, you're dealing with the fact that no galleries are owned by people of color. Uh, no institutions are controlled by people of color. And um, you have no say in the agenda. And so you're basically left sort of begging. Um, you know, you might get a grant here or there if, you know, if they decide that you're worthy of getting a grant. Um, but basically, you don't have access to any power. And I'll, I'll just give you um, a quick example if, you, if yeah. you want. I would love that, yes. So our, our government-owned broadcasting, television broadcasting company is called the CBC. I guess it was our take on the BBC. Um, and um, when I was young, I was called into the CBC because they were getting in trouble for not having enough writers of color. And so I took a meeting there. And so I went into the boardroom and the boardroom was older white people. I think five gentlemen and two ladies. They all had gray hair. Most of them have British accents. Um, some of the men were wearing tweed jackets with like leather patches on their elbows. <laughs> I think one had a, a bow tie on. And they were quite genteel and polite and whatever. And um, so I had submitted a story that I wanted to develop um, with the CBC. And, um, and so they, the first thing they told me is, um, we don't want any us and them stories. We don't want any stories about how difficult life is in Canada for, for you know, Black people. We want stories about how well people get along and how people are living the Canadian dream. And I was like... Okay. <laughs> uh, so you I grew want up their version of reality, not black people's version of reality. I didn't want anything controversial um, and nothing, nothing too spicy. So you know, always wanted something, you know, always wanting something fairly vanilla. And um, and um, 
me growing up in the ghetto and uh, growing up in government housing in Canada, that wasn't my reality at all. So I'd written a thing um, called BBMF. And um, so they asked me, they said, what does the BBMF stand for? And I didn't want to answer. And they kept pressing me and they kept pressing me. And I finally had to say, um, it stands for big black motherfucker. <laughs> and uh, you should have seen their faces. And the reason I called the story that, and I, did, you know, I, I didn't want to spell out the, the whole words, was a story about a guy who was a gangbanger, was a, you know, a tough guy. And he spent a number of years in prison and he's older and he gets out. And um, he, had, he developed a friendship with an older guy that he had met in prison who's also out and becomes like his father figure and a mentor and whatever. And the older guy tells him, I mean, you know, don't waste your life. Look around the neighborhood and just figure out, you know, what you can do that's positive. Mm -hmm. And he starts trying to figure out little ways of making the, his neighborhood and, you know, a little bit better. And he becomes sort of a for positive force gradually. It's not like some uh, magic wand happened in his community. So that was the idea that he was a big black motherfucker. He was one of those guys that could have easily spent the rest of his life in jail. But luckily, you know, he didn't. He, he turned himself around. But, I mean, the shock <laughs> in that room. Yeah. Uh, it was not what they were looking for. So no, no, never. So needless to say, I didn't get that gig. Um, what do you mean? I'm so I'm shocked. I'm so, I was so shocked. It took, yeah, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> you had it in the bag. <laughs> so uh, yeah. So you know, in Canada, we get things like Shit's Creek. I mean, that's the kind of thing they like to make in Canada. Um, so no, they didn't want to. Isn't that like one? That I've never seen Shit's Creek, but I've heard it's just amazing. <laughs> That's it, a it is. Thing, eh? It is. A, it is an amazing show, but it it's one amazing. of the it's one of the whitest shows you can see. There's only one non-white character uh, in the show, um, and it's he is of no importance. No important character in that show is is anything other than as white as possible. So, <laughs> you know. And I was talking to a friend of mine uh, last week, and we couldn't think of a Canadian show. You know, where um, people of color were the dominant characters in the show um so yeah yeah <laughs> so then for you as an erotic artist because again it, i mean it, it, just being an erotic artist is going to be controversial you're going to hit roadblocks and censorship you're gonna to have to deal with all kinds of shit because erotic is like you know sinful but then being an erotic artist who's also black <laughs> yeah i mean um Actually, I, I've had just as many problems being, you know, a straight cisgendered man than wow. being black, ah. because that that cuts the wrong way too. So I'm yeah. I'm in all the I'm in all the wrong categories. You're all the wrong. You <laughs> I'm just, just all, can't get a break. I'm just, right? <laughs> I'm just all the way wrong. <laughs> You're born born wrong. <laughs> I was born wrong. That's gonna be the title of my autobiography. <laughs> born wrong. Um. You know, it's it's curious because being from Trinidad, I don't have the typical sort of European Calvinist view of, of sexuality. I never thought it was bad. I never thought it, it needed to be kept a dirty little secret. I never felt that women who were sexually expressive, you know, was, were doing something bad. I mean, where I come from, hey, that's good. <laughs> you know, you know more. <laughs> you know if a woman wants to have many lovers and whatever we say yeah queen go you know <laughs> do your thing i mean it you know wasn't you know so this the whole sort of wrapping sex in such shame um just was so alien to me and so when i st started working in the realm of sexuality i was always sort of hitting my head against you know those walls mm -hmm. where it's you're just supposed to go on the assum certain assumptions so one assumption is sex is dirty another assumption is sex is private and has no place in the public you know discord um thirdly that if you are going to present sex you have to present sort of thin white people in their 20s and if it's women they have to have their ribs showing that's very important 
that their ribs must be showing. <laughs> wait, 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 what is, is that? Is that an actual thing, or is that it's just not, like you something you've observed? It's not in the rule book. It's, um, a, it's an unspoken rule, though. It seems to be. It's the standard. Ninety um, percent of the nude and erotic photographers are white men, um, and they like they, ribs. They're obsessed with. 20 year old white women who are thin and have their ribs showing. Um, and I can challenge anyone to go look at people's work and that's what you'll see. And what, what you'll see is they pose these women and men too, like statues in these sort of artificial positions. And they use sort of the same 22 uh, positions. Um, and um, it has often no bearing to what real sex and real you know human interaction looks like and when you look at the photos you you can't get a read on what these people's actual personalities are like or if they have any kind of inner life at all it's all on the surface there's nothing from the inside you know coming out Mm -hmm. and they're like dolls being posed they're they're literally mannequins Mannequins, and, and mannequins. and they and they would be at home in any storefront <laughs> in, yeah. in you know in um in Amsterdam or something in re- some red light district or something um so for me it, it's just so alien um mm. for me wow yeah I, I like the real deal and and there's power in in truth and there's power in in reality and the reality is um that um diversity is the most powerful thing so i love um photographing people of all different shapes and sizes and colors and genders and identities and and just everything um it's enriching for me as an artist Uh, i would be bored if i was just shooting one body type or you know one age group or one orientation um but i think for presenting it to the public it's good nourishment um the public is starving literally because what they're mostly seeing is porn uh, or soft core porn which to me is just as bad <laughs> and um they're not seeing their reality reflected back to them and that's sort of the chief job of an artist yeah. is to go forth in the world and ch- channel back to people you know, what you see, what you feel, what you learn, what you experience. And through the unique sort of worldview of a particular artist, people's lives, you know, can be enriched. Um, just, you know, a couple of examples. My, my life personally was so enriched by listening to the worldview of Bob Marley and Marvin Gaye, yeah. um, you know, and, and they were reflecting back to me some real shit. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, I think that that's a, a good standard to hold yourself to, even if you fail to, you know, reach that level, why not, you know, why not try? So you have to think about it. Like if Bob Marley was a sex photographer, what kind of photos would he make? <laughs> well, and that's, that's really like two, two things are standing out for me in what you're saying. Number one is in terms of this worldview and, 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 and what is erotic and sexual, you coming from Trinidad, where your culture is this, you know, it sounds like from what you described, you celebrate sexuality, you celebrate the embodiment and the expression of that vitality and that eros and the women or, you know, all shapes and sizes so you that that is the standard for you and then you come to you know this culture where it's like anorexia is the standard so that contrast is going to be really apparent for you and like so how amazing that you the work that you're doing you get to uh help transform that lens because because what we're normalized to which is skinny white ribs essentially (laughs) The McRib, the McRib sandwich um, is, is so um, alien, as you said, to you. And then also the other thing that's coming to me is diversity is actually the norm. And even we're not even talking about like skin color diversity, but even just body type diversity is the norm. Like that one lens, that one view that, that, you know, you have to be a hundred, hundred pounds, you know, five foot six, blah, blah, ribs, implants that sort of thing that's that's a very small percentage of the people on this planet 
the majority is all different shapes and sizes and bubbles and pimples and ripples and rolls and concave oh, yeah. and convex. Like oh, that is the norm. So I hear that that imperative for that to be what is what we're able to consume uh, as humans. It is nourishment. We're we're our just visually our eyes are designed to like take in curves and and the landscape and geography and all of that and be nourished by that that sensuality that we're witnessing so i can see how that that and i'm relating and resonating with how the imperative of that being a part of our experience of consuming eroticism is having this this more organics and less artificial totally and it, and if we take it out of the realm of sexuality and even put it in the realm of science yeah. um, it's a well-known sort of scientific fact that if you don't have diversity especially genetically <laughs> you know yeah. you get lots of problems and yeah. if you look at agriculture one of the biggest problems we're having is monoculture Mono crop. Yeah, yeah. and we need our farms to be more di- diverse so that the bees can thrive and so you know we can you know <laughs> be in some sort of balance so I need yeah. happy people holding hands. That that is the imperative. That's that's what nature wants. Shiny happy peas and people and bees and plants holding hands. Yeah, so unfortunately the world of um of eroticism and pornography is a world mostly of monoculture. Yes. And 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 inbreeding. So not too healthy. <laughs> yeah, wow. Wow. So so Let's talk a little bit about about the the legacy that that leaves when when we're when there is just this one lens that eroticism is being viewed through when it comes to pornography and mainstream sexuality, mainstream Western sexuality. There's one lens, and it's and it's the it's the lens viewed by one specific demographic of people. And then how does that create? this toxicity in in the field of 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 sexuality or in the experience of sexuality i'll say well for one thing um it it harms people um <laughs> simple as that <laughs> it, it's it's harmful it's harmful Vi- you know visuals are very powerful they're very they're very very powerful so if you're a you know a young person and you grow up and you're exposed to hundreds of thousands, if not millions of particular kinds of images, it, it, it can have a profound effect on how you see yourself and how you see the world and how you, you know, how you interact with the world. So if you're constantly receiving the message that, um, you know, that you don't, you don't belong, that you're not going to be celebrated, mm-hmm. that you're not going to be appreciated, that there's something wrong with you, there's something wrong with your your hips there's something wrong with your thighs there's something wrong with your butt there's something wrong with your face um there's something wrong with you know with your with your belly um those are very destructive uh messages and that's just on the superficial sort of body image ish you know level when you get into the levels of sexuality when the way that you want to intimately connect with another person you're being told is wrong is you know not worthy something to be ashamed of something that you might get punished for there's countries in this world where you can get killed for (laughs) you know that is a very damaging and you know dangerous um you know message then as you're getting older and you're getting fed the message that people over 30 are not worthy of being looked at you know the not worthy of being worshipped celebrated whatever that's also not a very you know helpful um you know message so the messaging is is really toxic it's almost like someone invented a message bomb and wanted to create as much damage as possible you couldn't probably in a lab design a better weapon for harming people's self-esteem and and harming sort of their place in the world um other than these kinds of messages and the messages are not just in the realm of sex the messages are also in music videos they're in, in movies television shows um in in advertising i mean oh god we could spend hours talking about what advertising's been doing f- 
to people for the last 100 years. So, uh, um, yeah, we've, and the thing is, sadly, um, you know, people aren't protesting it enough. People aren't challenging it enough. People aren't doing what, you know, what they can to, to tear it down. Um, because we're just so used to it. Um, well, and in fact, in terms of porn, there's a lot of controversy because, I mean, there there are, like, I, I just want to say that I support sex workers and I support people who love doing porn. And there's, a, like, gr- wonderfully now, thanks to, like, our generation and the millennial generation as well, there's, there's different types of porn being produced. There's porn being produced with by and with people of color. There's porn being produced that has more of a more, it's a more feminist or ethical viewpoint. So there is diverse, I will say, or, or non-mainstream porn that is being produced by people now to fill that niche. And on the other hand, when, I, when, we're ta- when I'm talking about the negative impact of porn, I'm talking about like mainstream internet porn like your normal average and, the, and that industry that's that's been in place since you know the hustler and playboy and all of that that specific you know um industry of porn which is unethical very patriarchal deeply white supremacist and deeply damaging and has all these things that you're that you're talking about and 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 particularly uh, you know, the body types. And I love what you said about, you know, being told your whole life or, or when you're particularly in the erotic realm that like your body type isn't beautiful, even when it's just a normal body, you know, that it's not acceptable and beautiful because you don't fit into this little tiny box, but also the demonstration of the interactions are usually devoid of connection. They're usually, you know, not, there's not emotion being shared. There's really bad sex technique. <laughs> <laughs> And it isn't about the cultivation of mutual pleasure. It's about the orientation is getting off and, 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 and entertainment. And that's great if you know that that's what you're getting. But unfortunately, porn is where so many people get, mainstream porn is where so many people get their sex education, quote unquote. And it's a horrible type of education to be consuming. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> um, it's, I think it's particularly problematic for young people there are two generations now who have had their whole sex education on the internet um, with porn. And I've seen in my own work, when I'm photographing couples, I can tell when I'm photographing them how much porn they've watched. Yeah. But it, wow! Because it totally changes how they have sex. Yes! And, Thank you for saying that. Okay, go on. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, it's now to the point where I'm, where I'm interviewing people to decide who to photograph or not. I ask them, you know, if they watch porn and how much porn they've watched and if they've watched a lot of porn, I won't shoot them. Um, and I don't mean to be discriminatory, but I've just found that it, it, it just, you know, it totally changes things. And there's some people, for example, when I've started playing a shoe with them, they've said, well, you know, when we have sex, we normally watch porn when we're having sex it's part of our um foreplay and i'm like god help you and uh no thank you (laughs) and you cannot be watching porn why don't you watch each other i mean why don't you you know what you know why don't you tune into each other instead of tuning into this other thing um so um yeah um so the sort of myth is it's all young men who get messed up by it. And certainly I've seen young men who just want to mimic a male porn star. They want to like pop uh, some Viagra and just pound someone like their hamburger. And that's fine. I mean, I'm okay with pounding. I've done some pounding in my life. Um, (laughs) I can assure you. You you can always go for a good pounding here and there, you know? I assure you, you know. Uh, yes, my you bring your man, but I have pounded. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, give me a, give me a pound, Debbie. Give me, give me Bam. Pound. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, my light. This this conversation is so dynamic. My light flipped down. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> okay, I flipped my own light. Um, <laughs> I flipped your switch. <laughs> I flipped the switch. Um, so sure, young man, for sure. 
But I've seen young women and with the young women from the time they're preteens, even they're hypersexualized. Yeah. They start dancing these, you know, freaky dances that they see on music videos. And uh, cause I even you see them on the streets practicing these dances. And uh, you know, I've got a young daughter myself and it's mm-hmm. alarming. <laughs> Luckily she's not into it <laughs> so far, but uh, um, and you know, they have weaponized their own sexuality to get attention and whatever. And when you see their posts on Facebook or Instagram or whatever, it's all this sort of part Miley Cyrus, part Kim Kardashian, part who knows what, um, sort of hypersexuality and hyper sort of self-awareness where you're always on and you're like, you know, you know certain angles to hold your body and, you know, you're always checking yourself out and, and whatever. And they have, and this is all generalizations, there are, you know, obviously exceptions. But what I find with young women that I photographed that have watched a lot of porn, um, they've bought into this idea of what women's sexuality is supposed to be that's, like. That's the key. It's It's not, it's not the you know, the innocent and wholesome expression of sensuality and the exploration that comes, you know, when we're 12, 13, we're starting like, ooh, my, you know, chest is growing. Like, what does this mean? So it's not the innocent sensual expression of that. It's it's the buying into this artificial concept, this construct of what sexuality should look like and performing. So their sexuality is is performative as opposed to authentic. And that's the tragic legacy, I think. Yeah. That, I think that is, you know, the tragic le- legacy. And it puts a lot of pressure on young women to be open to things they may, may not be ready for. Exactly. Yes. But, and without without encouraging attunement to their own bodies. Yeah. yeah. So we could go that we and we will keep going down the rabbit hole. But what I want to talk about now in our remaining time is how your work is the medicine, how your work is the antidote to correct this toxicity that we're discussing because you specialize in authentic sexual expression and and capturing that so that we have visual representation of all of these things that are lacking and missing from the from the mainstream culture so let's talk about your projects you have the goddess sex goddess sexual goddess art project and then you've got another one with couples so would you be willing to share about both of those projects um sure um Seven years ago, <laughs> I started, you know, photographing people having sex. And I, and I did four books, which um, have 689 photos of, of that. And yeah, I mean, I happily was able to get a wide diversity of, of people. It, it, you know, the project's always been very trans inclusive. Um, and I was very happy about that. Um, it's very age in- inclusive um, from 20 to 76. Um, there's many different body types and I love the diversity of, of bodies. And that's one of the things that I learned personally from doing the project is the body you're in has no relationship to your ability to give and receive pleasure. I've, you know, I've seen 360 pound people um, give and receive pleasure in ways that made me so envious i was like wow i you know i wish i could throw you know throw down like that um and i'll just tell you another little factoid um every woman over 60 that i've photographed in the last few years has been a squirter and has been you know very multi-orgasmic and i would never have guessed that um you should see so many 16, 7 year old people go. And it's given me lots of hope because I'm 56 now and I'm hoping, you know, that sex doesn't end in your 60s and 70s. And from seeing these people, it hasn't. Yeah. And it's also been inspiring to just see people adore each other. Just simple adoration. It, you know, it does to me, it's not about penetration. Um Sometimes people, when they see my work, they'll say, where's all the genitals? <laughs> like, yeah. if you want to see genitals, there's, there's places where you can see genitals. I don't focus on genitals. I focus mostly on people's faces. Um, not to say that I'm not, 
shooting full length photos sometimes, but definitely it's not, you know, genital it's focus. Of, yeah, it's not your point of focus is the genitals of, like porn. Like, you know, that's a point of focus for porn. So what you're you're focused on the humanity of the person, it sounds like. Yeah, I'm photographing people. And the adoration that I've seen and to be in the room, to be in the same room with adoration um, is a religious experience. And I don't say that lightly. Um, so it's, it's just amazing. It's amazing seeing people that have been together for decades and how well they know each other and how well they know each other's bodies and the sort of uh, um, jokes that they tell each other that only each other can get. <laughs> and the, you know, the, the language they speak to each other that only each other can understand. Um, you know, it's been amazing. And I've seen amazing things with people that have been together for a long time. And I've seen amazing things with people that are getting together for the first time. I mean, some of my best shoots have been with people um, having sex for the first time. And, and it just showed me that if you are in the right spirit, um, you can connect deeply and profoundly, you know, at any time with, with anyone. Um, so I, I've learned a lot personally. I, that's one of the things I say in my writing is before this project, I thought I knew a lot about sex. Um, I knew nothing. I knew nothing. And I maybe still know nothing. Maybe there's so much more, you know, still to learn, which is great. It, it means that I can continue on, you know, the journey that I haven't just reached some end point. So yeah, I, I did s four books of the sex goddess project. And in that I was very open. I didn't know what was out there. So I just said that I would photograph people from all different walks of life having sex in many different ways people have sex in many different ways for many different reasons and i didn't you know i didn't want to be judgmental or put too many barriers on the project so i was just open and i photographed and sometimes it was things that made me uncomfortable <laughs> or things that uh you know i didn't need to see um but a lot of times it was just so wonderful but now I, you know, I feel like I've done a good job with that and I've, you know, moved on now and I've just started a new project, which is called my intimacy project. And it still is a sex project, but I now have a much better idea of sort of what I personally like the most to photograph. And what I like the most to photograph is, is just simply love. Um, I love photographing people that are giving re and receiving love in whichever ways they want to do that and even when I'm photographing people solo because I do photograph people solo I enjoy people that have a really healthy amount of self-love yeah. and 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 can self-adore and it's actually one of the many many things I've learned is for a lot of people it's harder to self-adore than it is to you know to connect with another person um, some people it's very uncomfortable just being by yourself and having to face how you really feel yeah. about your body, how you really feel about yourself. So when people feel really good about, uh, about their body and about themselves, then it's, it's great. And our mutual friend, that was one of the things I really, you know, liked most about her, you know, from the beginning, cause I started photographing her, I think five years ago and um, she just had such self-love. <laughs> <laughs> And, and had this big smile on her face. And I was just like, wow, you know, what a happy camper. <laughs> and, and, you know, and loves to be filmed self-pleasuring. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Our first shoot, um, there were some epic photographs of just her in a bathtub, you know, with herself. Um, and, you know, epic, you know, epic proportions. And so um, that's what I'm doing now is... Um, I'm no longer, you know, some people have sex for fun or just for the, the power dynamics, you know, maybe dominance and submission or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, for some people, um, you know, it's transactional or whatever, whatever, you know, it's lots of different things. For me, um, for the new project, it's about intimacy. I'm photographing people that are willing, ready and able to be open to be soft, to, you know, be very present and to, you know, you know, be in the spirit of love, um, whether they're by themselves or, or with others. So um, it's going to, 
it's it's going to be harder to pull off, but I like challenges because mm. even some of the people that I photographed uh, having sex were perfectly happy, happy to be photographed having sex. When I said to them, okay, now you have to do it, you know, in the spirit of love and with intimacy and, and such, they were like, no, can't do it. <laughs> That's so fascinating. I find that I just, I find, I do find that so fascinating how, uh, it, myself included, how for some of us as human beings, uh, it, it's easier to fuck than it is, you know, just rub your genitals together than it is to be, to be seen. Yes. Right? So, yeah. so when I tell people how I'm shooting, I, you know, first thing I tell them is before I ever roll the camera, you know, you know, they're going to do intimacy um, exercises so they're going to, you know, stare at each other, look at each other, look at each other's eyes, uh, synchronize their heartbeats and stuff like that. And people are like, some people are like, nope. <laughs> that's, that's fascinating, right? I mean, that's, that was me like many, many years ago. Now it's like, I can't imagine not like if there isn't connection, then it's like fucking cardboard. I may as well, you know, have my. Well, the, thing, the thing is, it's, you have to be very naked to allow yourself to be in that state. And so you're very vulnerable. So for some people, um, they want a bit of a level of protection. Um, They want to, you know, they want to have a bit of a defense up Mm -hmm. and to be, and to be told, no, you cannot bring your defenses in there. Um, You have to be completely open and completely vulnerable. That um, is daunting for some people. Um, And really it's, it's just a, a mind fuck because really, in reality, it's not da- it's not da- daunting as long as you get your own mind out of the way. But what, you know, if you overthink it and say, "Oh my God, this photographer wants me to be in this really raw state," and then other people are going to see that, yeah. uh, you know, it's it's a challenge. It's a challenge. Well, I can certainly see how how it would it could be terrifying to for the world to see you like that. I'm thinking like just in, just in intimate connection with one other human being. Like I've seen, I've, I've been in the experiences where we're since at practicing Tantra uh, when I was dating way back when, when trying to do like, you know, the, the harmonized breathing and eye gazing where I'd have dudes be like, yeah, no, 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 no. I'm like, you want to fuck me, but you don't want to follow my breath. Like that doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> I, I actually understand it. Um, so what people have told me, cause I've, you know, I've been talking to people. And some people have been really hurt when they've let other people in, when they've let their guard down. And so almost as a reflex, it's like, no, I don't want to let my guard down. Mm -hmm. I don't want to engage with you on a deep level. I don't know if you're going to hurt me. I don't, you know, I don't want to. I get that. But why would you think that you can have access to my vagina? (laughs) Because because lots of people are willing to give access to their vaginas without that kind of deep connection. You're, you're the anomaly. They're not the anomaly. <laughs> you know, they're the, you know, they're more in the mainstream than, than you and I, um, we're the freaks. We gotta, we gotta be realistic about that. <laughs> okay. We're building our tribe of freaks and all of you on sex is medicine that also enjoy, not that you have to, no judgment, but all who also enjoy authentic connection mixed with your sex and it doesn't even have to be like again you're married or whatever i've had authentic connection with one night stands that have been off the hook but the key is the connection the key is that there's this openness and this vulnerability and an exchange and a, and a sharing um and that it sounds like that's what you're really you're modeling that's what you're capturing with your work and modeling for other people so i i'm curious how do we get our hands on these books <laughs> Because these sound like great. I want to put them on my coffee table. So when we have our family over for Christmas, we can have conversations about them. <laughs> well, the bad news is you mostly can't get your hands on these books. No! Why not? Why, why would you tease us like this, Ricardo? Uh, what do you think? It's not, I'm no tease. I'm no tease. Um, no, I mean, um, one of the things I had to be careful about in asking people to you know give me their authenticity or at least lend it to me is i had to think about um not you know overexposing my work yeah um basically if i just put all these images out on the internet or whatever what would happen you know what would happen to the work and what would happen to my people so that's never been um the idea 
um, the project's always been for supporters and collectors. Wow. So, so with my book, for example, with the four books, each of the four books, there's only 300 copies of each book. They're signed, limited edition copies. Um, so, yeah, if someone wanted, you know, to, you know, be involved in the project and support the project, they can contact me and I can tell them how to go about doing that and they can get a book. Sure. But you can't just sort of order it on Amazon or something like that. It's not yeah. that kind of project. But so it's I wanted, exclusive. It's exclusive. I, I wanted to, you know, to cultivate a community of people that cared about the project and, and wanted to support it. Mm-hmm. Um, I do do some things, you know, as outreach. Pre-COVID, I had 14 events where I would read some of the stuff I've written about the project. I've, I would have a woman read some of the stuff that the models have written about the project because they've written quite a bit. And I would show some of the images, not all, um, on a flat screen TV. Mm-hmm. And then we would um, do like a 90 minute question and answer session afterwards. And I love I love doing those. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I learned actually so much about the project. I've actually learned more from feedback from other people than I've learned from myself. <laughs> yeah, so those yeah been- that sounds amazing. I would love to set up something like that in Kelowna post COVID. Because that's yeah, yeah. amazing and enriching. And so it's not just like looking at these pictures and like, oh, ha, ha, ha. It's actually an education. Yeah. And, um, and I've even done some of those, um, you know, some of those, you know, o- online as well. Mm. Um, but so, yeah, so people can um, get involved, can have access to the images, but they, you know, they can't just flip, you know, click a button and order. Yeah. So. I would encourage people to check out my site, sexgoddessproject.com. And, uh, you know, if they are interested in finding out how to, you know, how to buy the work or, or want to be photographed or want to attend a future event, you know, to, to contact me yeah. and, and um, doing other things and finding other ways to put the, you know, get the work out in a safe way. Like we were talking about before this interview, the NFT, the whole NFT idea. So next month, I'm releasing 10 of my more sort of PG-13 images. Um, none of these images have genitals. So if you're a genital fan, it's not going not gonna to happen. So I have a, a, a small series called, well, I'm calling my love drops. Because when you release something as an NFT, it's called a drop. And um, it's just 10 photos of people sort of kissing, looking at each other, adoring each other. Um, and it's a way of introducing people to my work. So um, that's another way people can, you know, start, you know, getting involved in, and collecting the work and whatever is to, um, is to, you know, um, acquire an, an NFT. So, so will the these- information about that be at your sex, sexgoddessproject.com? So like if, if people are hearing this episode and they want, they know that they want to have access to your work or an event in the future, they can just go to uh, sexgoddessproject.com and then that'll that'll tap them into all the stuff you've got going on is that correct yes and everything involves contacting me uh for me um i have to have a relationship yeah you know, um so no no one can sort of anonymously buy a ticket for this or whatever everything has to you know involve some some contact because you're so, building community around this exactly yeah yeah exactly. beautiful <laughs> beautiful beautiful yeah we are just about out of time. Before we go, any anything you want to make sure that our audience knows about you and your work and all of that? Um, not necessarily so much about me, but one thing I, you know, want to do is I want to. There's not enough artists and creative people, you know, doing you know sexual art, and I can understand that because I didn't want to do it either. <laughs> And I resisted for many years. I, you know, I've been a photographer for 35 years. I've only been photographing sex for the last seven of those 35 years. I didn't want to do it. I knew that there'd be some, you know, backlash and, you know, drama and controversy and obstacles and whatever. Um, so I could understand some people's reluctance to do it. And not all creative people are going to have sex as their cause, uh, celeb, right? Um, 
But uh, I would just say to people out there, if you are a creative person and you, know, you are interested in, in working with sex, please do it because there's not enough people doing it. Mm. And, and the world you know, really needs it. If we think about it, um, if we think about human rights, we fought so hard you know, for civil rights. We fought, fought hard for the white rights you know, for women. Uh, we fought hard for rights for handicapped people. Um, we fought hard for LGBTQIA rights. Um, we fought so hard for many different kinds of rights. We haven't been fighting for the right of freedom of sexual expression. You know, nope. there, are, there are no big campaigns for it. There is no Nelson Mandela type figure, <laughs> you know, Let's leading. Let's do it. You and me, Ricardo. Let's do yes. it. <laughs> okay. You'll, you'll be Nelson and I'll be Mandela. And yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> the bit together will be Nelson Mandela. But yeah, I mean, it's not, you know, why is sex always being left out of the conversation? Exactly. You know, we have to get over this collective hang up we have about it. Um, sex is important. We wouldn't be here without it. <laughs> so um, I would, you know, that, that would be the one thing to, I would say is please, please, creative people, start doing more work with sex and just, you know, however you want to do it, do it. I mean, it's always going to be, specific to your journey and your worldview but we need we need more people doing it we need more sexual art we need more sexual art because sex is medicine because sex is medicine (laughs) (laughs) it's been so wonderful having you ricardo and i look forward to chatting with you again on sex is medicine again you are just a wealth of wisdom and information and it's just it's been a joy thank you for this opportunity it's been great (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. I hope it has been enriching for your eardrums and your brain and all the rest of you on every level as it has been for me. It's always a, a, an incredible honor and opportunity to uh, to share this with you. Um, so catch us next week for another wonderful episode. And in between episodes, make sure you connect with us on uh, all social media at Authentic Tantra, our website, AuthenticTantra.com. You can sign up for our free stuff uh, and make sure you subscribe to all episodes of Sex is Medicine in Spotify, iTunes, TuneIn, YouTube, all the places. Have a wonderful, wonderful evening. Blessings. You've been listening to Sex is Medicine with Davey Ward Erickson your number one resource for holistic sex education. You can listen to and subscribe to Sex is Medicine on Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, iTunes, iHeartRadio, and YouTube. Just search Sex is Medicine with Davey Ward. Stay connected with me and my guests on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Authentic Tantra. And learn how you can use Tantra as medicine to heal, awaken, and empower every area of your life at AuthenticTantra.com. Make sure to tune in to Sex is Medicine every Thursday at 7 p.m. Pacific on Contact Talk Radio Network. And join our watch party every Thursday evening on Facebook at Authentic Tantra. We look forward to you joining us next week for another episode of Sex is Medicine with Davey Warren.